Welcome everyone. My name is Rick Burke. I'm the executive editor of STAT, which is a two and a half year old um, publication, online publication that covers health medicine, life sciences. And if you want to know more on your seat, there's information and there's actually a special deal for everyone here if you want to sign up for our um, subscription service. So you can look there for statnews.com. That's the end of my plug for STAT. And I just want to tell you how, um, how excited I am about this panel. We're here to discuss one of the hottest issues facing the world, the world, the explosion of artificial intelligence and machine learning over the last year. There's enormous hope that these technologies will lead to better and earlier treatment, redu reduce drug dis discovery times, lower the cost of R&D, and more precise treatment. But a big looming question, as you all know, is who should we trust for these advances, computers or just smart humans? Um, and when we hear about the amazing possibilities, should we be hopeful or should we be wary of all the hype, or both? We have a powerhouse panel here that represents this landscape very well. Uh, let me introduce everyone. From the far right, we have Rowan Chapman, who is the head of Johnson & Johnson Innovation California. Uh, we have Aya Khalil, Chief Commercial Officer and co-founder of GNS Healthcare. To my left is Lloyd Minor, Dean of Stanford Medicine. And then we have Megan Zweig, Director of Research at Rock Health. And at the end, George Yankopoulos, President, Chief Scientific Officer and co-founder of Regeneron Pharmaceuticals who came here um, despite this, this horrible accident you had. Do you want to explain for a second? <laughs> it's, it's not worth it, just a torn Achilles, but I can take a hit and keep on ticking. That's great. Um, and before we start, um, as a way to dive right in, I want to show you a two minute video that we did at STAT that raised questions about one of the most high profile machine learning initiatives, and that was, that's IBM Watson. It made the promise of recommending patient um, or cancer treatments to doctors, but has fallen short of the expectations. So I'm going to show you that video with the warning that they just told me a couple minutes ago that it's not clear if we'll have sound on this two-minute <laughs> video. So let's, you know, it's, it's technology, you know, that's, that's the issue. Be wary. So, so I have no <laughs> idea if we're going to have sound, but let, why don't we show the video and uh, do the best we can. No sound. All right. Um, well, this is, um, I'll try to, <laughs> this is like Watson on Je winning Jeopardy. Um, I'll try to take you through this. It's much better with the sound. Um, that's their promotional material, how great Watson is going to be. And let's see if we can. Medical records, yes, <laughs> and it recommended treatments, but it, but turns out um, it's a fixed list of treatments that were all, that were not d decided by Watson, but they were already in existence. I watched it earlier today. I think okay, it's well, giving. Yeah, you're <laughs> I think it's giving some recommendations on the, the likelihood of success of different treatments. So it's <laughs> advising to the physician, uh, you know, you may want to prioritize evaluating these particular treatments. These are the ones you may want to assess, but be a little more wary because we don't think they're as likely to be successful, and these are the ones that we would not recommend. Um, but I think that some of the marketing implied that Watson would be looking for connections between what works and what doesn't work that don't currently exist. But I think what it's doing right now is spitting out uh, you know, currently defined care pathways that the physicians are already familiar with, but helping them prioritize between those. And so physicians are thinking this knows a lot more than it does. Potentially, yes. Potentially. Um, this is an experiment in the audience. Yeah. We're, just wait, we're kind of waiting. To it's like the old, I, I'll the old... Gi I'll give you guys some perspective. The old since sil you, silent movie. So, since you want perspective on this, what's the problem with Watson? Okay, if you give... You, we all know. 
if you feed an encyclopedia into a computer, the computer can spit it out probably better and faster than any human, so it can win at Jeopardy. If you have patterns that are easily learnable by a computer, like learning how to play chess, eventually a machine learning computer will do better than a human being. What's the problem in healthcare? The problem in healthcare is there's no encyclopedia to feed the computer. We don't know what causes most diseases and what they call the medical record. The medical record is not like an encyclopedia that has all your information. So the computer, to make a judgment for a human patient, is basing it on nothing because even the best, most of the best electronic health records that now exist are woefully short. There's just a few examples of useful electronic medical records uh, in the entire field. So it's sort of like asking you know, a chef, the greatest chef in the world, to make, try to make a gourmet meal out of garbage. Okay? It doesn't matter how good the computer is. It, it's mostly dependent on how good the information is that you can feed it. And in this field of healthcare and big data, you got to understand what's limiting. Computational approaches are not what's limiting. Great breakthroughs. There's brilliant computational biologists. I'm not saying that the, the best ones are going to yield the best product. But we need big data in this field, and that's what's really missing. And that's why an approach like Watson has no chance in hell right now because we don't have big data in this field. Is there a cautionary tale in, in, <laughs> in what Watson has done that anyone wants to? That wasn't cautionary enough for you? Uh. <laughs> it, it shows the problem. It shows the problem when you put maybe very good, for all we know, very good computational type people and so forth, involve them in a process that they really don't understand. The sort of the problems, the limitations, the morasses of current biology, biological sciences, and the healthcare system and why in any system that you study, it's always most important to understand what's the limiting bottleneck. And the limiting bottleneck is not AI and it's not machine learning and all that. It's really good big data, which right now doesn't exist in the field. Does anyone here um, take issue with the way George presented that? And, and does anyone here think, I, think Watson is something we should be excited about? No, I don't think anyone would say that. So, I, I mean, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> won't mince words here. So I agree with George that data is the limiting factor, but here's actually the hope, which is we have the ability to go in and collect a lot of the data that we do need today through technological advancements, from being able to sequence your entire genome. For every individual here, we could also look at entire lipid panels, proteome panels, and yes, EMR records as they're traditionally collected, are, are horrible, but we can do a better job of collecting great clinical records. I work with a, um, a foundation called the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, and they have a registry on 1,500 patients where they've gone through and collected really great longitudinal clinical grade records where we know for every multiple myeloma patient what their progression fee for survival is, overall survival, other clinical measures, and biopsies collected at the time of diagnosis where we've done whole genome sequencing, where we know what the expression of that pro of the tumor RNA is and other molecular factors. And from that data, we can start to tease out, as you said, via the computation. So it's not just about patterns. So that was the second thing. Yes, data is one, but the other is being able to go beyond patterns to learn causally what's driving the system. So in medicine, it's not just enough to be able to go, hey, you've clicked on this many things and your favorite shoe is Valentino versus I don't know what. <laughs> um, it's not about pattern recognition. It's really about teasing out the mechanism and the causes. And we can use statistical frameworks, this is what I use in my um, research, that learn causality directly from data, but where the machines come in is it allows you to do it at scale. And you can do it over many variables and over many patients. And so the hope today is that we start to mobilize to collect the data that we do need so we can get to the insights that will really impact patients and allow us to do a better job of figuring out that treatment matching. You're talking about oncology, so it's all biologically driven. So if you haven't fed the machine mutational data across many patients, you're not going to be able to accurately produce and predict what the right treatment option is for that individual. Let me jump to, to Rowan. When I think of, you know, when you think of IBM, you think of a very traditional um, company that's been a long, around a long time. You think of that with J&J, &J, and part of your role at J&J &J is to help the company break from tradition. What are, can you talk a little about that, and what are some of the, 
the, the, uh, the challenges you have. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when people think about Johnson Johnson, they think um, often people think about baby care products. But of course, J&J &J has three sectors. We have the pharmaceutical division, we have the consumer division, and the med device division. Now, all three of those divisions are incredibly interested in AI, machine learning, and the applications um, for advanced product development, and also for just delivering right care to the patient. So on the innovation side, when I look at AI and machine learning, I just am very pragmatic about it. I think about it like a stool. So you have the, the top of the stool, which is the computer technologies and the advanced algorithms that we can learn from FinTech, we can learn from or, um, Google, we can learn from, um, we we can learn from um, you name the um, targeted advertising, not just Google. That's, that's technology, that's the top of the stool. But the three pieces underneath for healthcare, and we've, we've addressed a couple of them, are applications, and that's one I get very passionate about. Applications, people, and data. You get very passionate about data and data quality. So when we think about applications, I get very excited about some of the image analytics applications. Because when you think about image analytics, we know Google is really good at it. And we know that today, if you go and do a search on Google Images, it actually labels them. The computer is labeling them because it's using some of what it's learned, and it's continually learning when people are clicking, if they're looking for two dogs on a beach, and they click on two dogs on a beach, that one actually then ups on, the, ups on its score. So that is then learning that really is two dogs on a beach because the person basically said it was. So what can you do in healthcare? Well, think about it. So when you're doing lung cancer, and you're taking a look at an image of lung cancer, um, you can take a look and say right down to the small pixel, is that thing that's only two millimeters, is that, I'm going to kind of get a bit technical, is that spiculated or glassy? So spiculated is when it has little um, tentacles, that's more likely to be malignant. The computers can see that before the humans. So you think about that, but you actually don't want people making a decision on that. Then you go all the way to the consumer. What if I went into, I'm not very good at makeup, but what if I went into a Nordstrom's and I went and had a digital image of my face and then I had a, some kind of makeup application that was determining based on exactly what was going on with my face and depositing the makeup in the right place. They are both image applications that are using fundamental machine learning, artificial imaging algorithms for different reasons. So it's all about applications, and that kind of boils down to the data. So if you're making a healthcare decision, what drug to actually put into a human, like a, an IBM Watson, you've got to be really sure you've got the right data. If you're making a makeup decision, you want to have some pretty good data, but it's not going to kill you if you get in the wrong place, if you don't co cover the blemish quite right. So that's why it's all about applications and then making sure that you're really learning from the right data because I think Ia would tell you and Lloyd would tell you um, that learning from the data, be very careful what data you're learning on. And I, I, can, I can go into some terrible examples of um, algorithms which have learnt on the wrong data and spat out the wrong answer and well, then led to and problematic we're go, decision making. I want to hear the terrible examples. We'll get yeah, back sure, to that. Yeah, sure, I can. Well, I, I can, to, but that's the, that's the way I right. think about it from Thank the J&J perspective. Let's go to Lloyd. Talk about sort of use of information. You have a good, a good example about how Google searches can be more effective than, than turning to electronic health records. And could, sure, sure. Earlier in my career uh, in the mid-late 90s, I described an inner ear disorder, a clinical syndrome. Um, it has certain characteristic signs and symptoms, one of those being that loud noises cause dizziness. So if you open the Google browser right now and you type noise dizziness, uh, you'd come up with several websites that describe this particular inner ear disorder. If you type those same words into most of the standard uh, electronic health records that are in use today, you get absolutely no decision support. So uh, still today, now everyone in my, my home field of otolaryngology has seen this disorder in patients, knows what to look for when they hear the key words is suspicious. But you know, an internist or primary care doctor may see one or two patients during her or his professional career with this disorder, and it may not in the 20 minutes they have allotted to see patient, a new patient, uh, they may not make that association. And right now the electronic health record doesn't even do what a Google search does in terms of prompting um, physicians, other healthcare providers uh, as to what the underlying cause may be or what may merit additional um, queries or, or, or testing uh, in order to come to the diagnosis. 
So, and, and George alluded to it in his comments, um, electronic health records have done a number of things. First, they have digitized data, although, again, we have to be concerned about the quality of that data and the, the format in which the data is stored. Uh, but certainly we're better off than the days in which everything was on paper and therefore tucked away and by and large inaccessible. Uh, but they're not really supporting the type of decision making nor are they providing the types of repository of data that can really drive the type of analytics that many people on this panel today are very, very expert at doing. And there are a host of reasons for that, but I think the most fundamental reason is that for the electronic health record companies, you know, the customer is the large healthcare delivery system. And, um, and the large healthcare delivery system is concerned about billing and compliance. And the EHRs do a very, very good job of that. Uh, and in their defense, the billing and compliance guidelines in the US today are extraordinarily complex. So they haven't necessarily addressed the issues associated with the delivery of care or improving the quality of care delivered. They've rather tended to focus on addressing um, um, the nuts and bolts issues of how to issue an accurate bill based upon the information that's put into the record. And that needs to change moving forward. And I hope that we're hosting a conference on June 4th at Stanford bringing in the leaders of EHR companies, some health system leaders, some academics that are thinking creatively in this space. And what's really encouraging to me is I'm seeing a lot of uh, entrepreneurs now interested in building intelligent front ends to these legacy EHR systems in ways that can make them much more interoperable and address the issues of care delivery that I just mentioned. Megan, let me jump in with you. And you've, you've done a deep dive into a study looking at demystifying AI. What is the sort of the biggest misconception out there that you found? Yeah, it's a good question. So I'm coming at this from a slightly different angle. Um, I work at Rock Health. We're a venture fund. We do seed stage investments in digital health companies, so companies where uh, the main value proposition really is leveraging some technology to make uh, healthcare services um, or managing your own health massively better. And so we, we undertook this study to essentially look at our data, which is more on the venture side of what are investors most interested in putting money into. So we're tracking all digital health deals uh, explicitly in the United States, over $2 million. Uh, and what we found is that a lot of the applications, and I think Watson is kind of the, the emblematic example of this, are really touting the clinical use cases. So you know this is going to help providers better diagnose, um, better customize treatment uh, to particular patients. And I'm extremely excited about those use cases. But I think what we saw from the data is that investors right now um, are putting a lot of money into uh, what I'll call kind of the, the less riskier spaces of healthcare that aren't directly touching patients. So things like back office functions, billing, scheduling, rev cycle, claims adjudication. Um, there was a lot of money going into companies that are uh, promoting population health management. So uh, a big use of machine learning in that space is being able to risk stratify populations. So making predictions based on lots of different streams of data about um, the health of that population and who's at risk for using more services um, so that whether it's the payer, whether it's a self-insured employer, a provider, they can better connect those patients with resources that are going to help them manage uh, whatever condition they're, they're dealing with. Um, another space that we saw a ton of money going into were research and development catalysts, largely on the pharma side. So a lot of investment in drug discovery, uh, in making clinical, tri clinical trial management a lot more efficient. So whether that's scouring through EHR data to find patients that are going to plug into existing clinical trials um, and, and expediting the, that process and reducing costs, that was another big space. So I'd say the biggest misconception is that I think we, we like to think of kind of the sexy side of AI, which is what all those Watson commercials were. I mean, they put, you know, John Hamm was one of their, their spokespeople. And so it's, you know, by putting kind of those clinical use cases at the center, I do think that a lot of people are overlooking um, a lot of the use cases that are in use today, uh, kind of the, the narrow uses of AI, and, and happy to go into some of those examples later on. Okay, great. George, let me jump to, to you. You've invented six drugs. Um, of the six, what's what's your favorite? What's the one that like 
It's like asking me, you know, which is my favorite child. Right, right. Um, I love each one more than the next. Uh, you know, we have the leading drug for fighting blindness in the United States called ILEA. Uh, the, one of the most highly cited examples of going from genes, maybe one of the best known example, going from a gene to a potential major treatment, which is this uh, new cholesterol lowering drug called Praluent. Uh, and we just recently filed on, I, I think, this drug that's going to change the face of allergic diseases ranging from asthma to atopic dermatitis. So we really, un and for those of you who don't know about it, discovering drugs is, is actually quantifiably the hardest thing that society does. Each year there's only 20 to 40 approved drugs by the FDA. Out of those, only 10 are what they call new or first in class. Most of them are just follow-ons and me-toos. Out of those 10, the majority are for rare or orphan diseases. What does that mean? Less than a handful of new first-in-class drugs for important diseases every year by the world. That shows how hard this is. This is not just coming up with the next Google app. This is really challenging. And we have come up with six uh, just in the last few years because I think we understand the process and what it takes. And to that, I, wanna, I think we have consensus on this board that uh, um, the, the difficulty here Watson might be the greatest computer known to man, but like I said, if you're feeding in garbage, you're going to get out garbage. And it's, you know, the three legs of this stool that hold the stool up, like Rowan was saying, that are, that are important. And like Rowan and I were focusing on, you know, you've got to cr start creating the data sets. The greatest computer in the world needs data. And I do agree with both of them. Um, uh, I have mentioned uh, this uh, collaboration with Myeloma Foundation, 1,500 examples of patients, deep data set. You know, and, and, and Rowan mentioned this lung cancer example, scans. Cancer is a great place to start for a variety of reasons. But what, to, to really do justice and take advantage of the opportunities and the possibilities of AI and machine learning, we need huge data sets involving millions of people. Uh, and we need to figure out how to create medical records that are useful in this regard. And, and towards this end, you may know that the NIH thought this was so important that about three, four, five years ago they announced the President Obama's Precision Medicine Initiative, the notion of sequencing a million Americans linked to their medical records in a way that would allow this, this dream of big data in the healthcare space to really work. In all those years since then, they've spent hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. You know how many people they've sequenced linked to medical records? Anybody want to guess? It's a very easy number. Any guesses out there? Zero. Yeah. Zero. So what we realize is, like I said, you know, like we got to build these. Okay, we got to build these sort of data sets. So and and like I said, it's going to take investment. It's going to take the investment in, in the orders of millions. So we announced, and, and I'm sure I'm sure that um, Lloyd knows all about this. One of the one of the few electronic medical record systems in the country that is not used for billing. There's all sorts of reasons why the billing electronic medical records are so contaminated. How many times does a doctor say to you, oh, you know, that's not covered, but I'm going to say you have this so you can get your MRI. I know, I just had one of those. Okay, <laughs> it means, what does that mean? That means that it's great for trying to get billing done, but it's useless. It literally is useless in many ways uh, for truly understanding mechanism and so forth. So we collaborating with Geisinger Health Systems, which many believe is the premier long-term electronic health records uh, in the country. We've committed to sequencing over a quarter million of their people. We've already gotten to between one and 200,000, all linked to detailed medical records. We also went to another place, which we think is an unusual set of records that are not only heavy in medical records and labs and everything you guys are talking about, but also the images that Rowan is talking about. We went to the UK Biobank, which has done a much better job than the US side in terms of creating a phenomenal database with hundreds of thousands of images of everything from lungs to livers, to the whole body, to the brain. Uh, and what we recognize is these are, these are the things you have to do. You have to access these. You have to make all of these images computational ready, and you have to link it to what I was talking about, the DNA sequence, and also to RNA, to the transcriptome. And so we've already sequenced, we just announced this collaboration. What I'm very proud of is the biopharma industry. Unfortunately, not J&J. &J, you guys should step up, too. But the biopharma <laughs> industry all stepped up. Okay, they are co-funding with us. We're doing all the work. We're sequencing everybody and creating in the cloud the link between all the images and all the medical records and the DNA and hopefully soon the RNA sequence. And a whole slew of our biopharma um, colleagues out there are helping us 
fund this, and we're going to make this all publicly accessible so everybody, all the greatest computational you know, biologists in the world will now have, they won't have rotten eggs to try to make a gourmet meal. They will have great data involving hundreds of thousands, soon millions of people, for which all the best minds will now be able to do what we're all dreaming about. Because this is what's limiting. This is what we got to understand. You know, it's sexy to talk about AI and machine learning, but it's a useless machine if you don't feed something useful into it. And what do you need to feed into it, really, to take full advantage, to get at what I say, true understanding of mechanism, true understanding of pathways, you need to arm it with millions of people's worth of really deep, hard data that you can count on that hasn't been created by the world. And we hope, maybe J&J, &J, well, we hope as many people will join as possible to create this resource for the world. Well, first of all, Roland, I think you, 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 you're here to defend J&J, &J, so do you have anything to say? No, you to say don't defend yourself. him, just say, sure, we'll join up. <laughs> Don't leave it to like <laughs> Pfizer and, and Biogen so, and Abby. Uh, we should talk offline. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so I agree with what you're saying, but I'm going to disagree with you on something. You've, you've thrown it at me, I'm going to throw it back at you. It depends on the application, how big the data set needs to True. be. True, I don't disagree. Absolutely. So if we're talking about a complex disease with complex genetics, Absolutely, you need to have very, very large data sets and you have to be super careful about the controls. And that sounds like old fashioned science, but it isn't. It's the control set that is massively important. So let's take an example where it's a behavior and genetic related disease. The best possible control is yourself as an individual. You are your best control. There's the population, but in the end, if it's behavior related and it has um, something beyond your genetics, it has who your community is, what your, your demographic is, where you live, you are your best control. So you have to actually think about that and are we going to have the data to be able to learn upon ourselves. If we're talking about something where you don't, it's not behavior related, where it's a specific point gene mutation. I have blue eyes. Beyond my control, beyond my parents' control, that's deterministic. That's genetically deterministic. There aren't that many things which are genetically deterministic. So it all depends on how complex the application is, to what size of data, to what size of control sets that you need. So when it comes down to images, they think the wonderful application of machine learning that's right in our face is actually triage of images. It's not making the final medical decision, it's the triage of images. The machines can do that pretty well. One of the hardest things is what Watson was trying to do, is take a complex genetic disease and turn around and say, do this treatment, when maybe you didn't have the right controls in that data set. And well, I think you, they didn't. you don't need controls if you can learn from variation. Actually. It learned from variation, so, but, the, but that, that, that is goes the control. To the point of yeah. being able to collect records and data on millions of people, yeah. because then you have the variation to learn from. Mm -hmm. And I agree that machine learning on imaging, great application when you're doing neural nets, right, where in the end of the day you're trying to re recognize something, right, an image of something. But we know to do right by medicine, we have to go beyond that. It's not, it can't just be about image recognition. And we do have to get to the holy grail of how to match treatments to patients, because we know the savings are in the trillions. and. It could increase life and I'm, I'm, all, quite over, quite I'm all over it. But, yeah, but I do want to make a add on to your point about applications. So to get to what's driving complex disease and our response to complex treatments and diseases like cancer, um, RA, and all of that, you do need that aggregation of data that are uh, the layering of data from genome to molecular to phenome. And uh, you know, a sophisticated EMR measure is just a way to get a better phenome. But if we're talking about um, we can today, and we have done this, taken data from the healthcare exhaust, be it claims and EMR, and start to identify who's at risk for an ER visit and how adherence could actually prevent some of those things. So there is still a lot to be done with the data that exists, but it doesn't get to those very deep, complex disease uh, questions. Well, well, let me ask you, what, all, talking about all this data, it just sounds really daunting and almost impossible. <laughs> yeah. Like, how do we achieve this? Uh, and unfortunately, I think like, it's even more daunting than we've touched on because we also have to keep in mind that the social, environmental, and behavioral determinants are still the major determinants of health. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a shocking and, and I think very disappointing fact that in our country today, the most accurate prediction of life expectancy is zip code in which mm -hmm. someone resides. 
Um, so we for sure need the type of uh, genotypic and phenotypic uh, data that has been discussed, but we also really need to dig in on the, in the related social, environmental, and behavioral factors that even after we've worked out the relationships uh, between genotype and various other risk factors, as you mentioned, adherence, I mean, that's going to be the ultimate determinant of whether or not we're able to put this knowledge, which we desperately need to generate, whether or not we're going to be able to translate this knowledge into actually improvements in health and healthcare delivery. I mean, Lloyd makes a great point, which we should all realize. We're all thinking about the future, and I do think it's important. It's not daunting. People have to get in there and start building the future today so there's a future in 20 years. But, you know, obviously, we all know what we're supposed to do, you know. If everybody watched their weight and exercise, and if they had hypertension to blood pressure medication, if they had high lipids, they, they, they took that, you would be addressing the major causes of disease in America. We know, unfortunately, that we don't understand ways of, of dealing with that right now. Uh, and these are approaches that may save us despite ourselves, despite our inability to control ourselves. And it is working. I mean, you say it's daunting, but our big data approaches right now, just last week in New England Journal of Medicine, one of the leading causes now of concern is obesity with associated type 2 diabetes and liver disease, doing exactly the sort of genetic variation with disease in hundreds of thousands of people. We reported a gene variation which protects people who are morbidly obese from developing liver disease, which both is a great predictor, but now can lead, we hope in a few years, to a drug that will protect people despite themselves so they won't go on and have liver failure and require a liver transplant. So these things are possible. There's short-term opportunities, but I think we all have to consider how we're going to build a big future that will cover everything, not just worrying about, hey, let's take advantage of this application right now because we can do it, or that application because it'll only take a thousand people, or this. We got to build the future that is going to really create a real change. And I think that that's going to require a lot of investment in a lot of long-term thinking. And, and what kind of investment are we talking about? How does this get accomplished? So I, I was at a conference last week on, on AI and healthcare in Boston, and Atul Gawande, who's a surgeon and healthcare thought leader, uh, was talking about this space. And I thought he made a really great point, which I think is similar to, to what you were saying, Lloyd, which is that we can't just think about breakthrough innovation. Um, we also have to think about follow-through innovation. And I think what his point was is that we also need to consider the providers and the patients that are going to be leveraging these tools uh, to do their jobs. And those people are inundated with data and decisions and they are so burnt out. Provider burnout is a serious, serious issue. And just to, just to make this concrete, I like to tell this story about a company called Cuventus. They're based in the Bay Area. Uh, what they do is they aggregate all sorts of billing data, uh, so that's claims data, data from the electronic health record, data on nursing scheduling and staffing, uh, call lights in the hospital, and what they do is they make predictions about throughput and about hospital operations. And so one specific thing that they predict is when are they going to see an influx of patients into the emergency room? And so they are texting that prediction to their nurses, to their nurse manager. And they didn't see any sort of change. Uh, they saw no improvement in, in things like length of stay and throughput. Uh, and the nurse said, you're just giving me a prediction. That's like giving me a GPS in my car and telling me, oh, there's a 30% prediction in three hours that there's going to be traffic on the 405. They're like, that is useless. I would throw it out the window. Uh, so Cuventus got a lot more specific uh, and actionable with that text. So now instead of just saying, hey, we predict in three hours that there's going to be an influx in the ED, it now says, hey, prepare for that influx. We think you need to turn over beds four, five, and six. Uh, that's going to make space to bring those patients in. They saw incredible improvements, and a lot of hospitals are now leveraging that tool. And so I think we also need to be as thoughtful as we are with the algorithms and the accuracy of those predictions with the application and how it's being incorporated into the workflow and in considering change management. Could you talk a, a little about the venture landscape? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that um, a lot of venture companies are excited about um, solutions like that. So as I was talking before, a lot of these are, are, are narrow solutions. So just to give another example of um, one of our portfolio companies, Omada, um, which has gotten a lot of, a lot of uh, interest in venture funding lately. So uh, they're a digital therapeutic, which means that they're treating people um, who have prediabetes to prevent them from getting uh, getting diabetes and actually reversing that. So 
It's a remote uh, healthcare pro coaching program. There's a connected uh, scale so that they can track weight over time. They're giving fitness, nutrition, advice, and all those things that we know um, <laughs> that will help these patients. Uh, one thing that they do is they leverage machine learning to make predictions about which of those patients are going to most respond uh, to more intensive health coaching. They only have a limited number of health coaches. They can't be deployed intensively to every single patient. Let's predict um, who's going to benefit most from this. So again, it, it's a pretty simple, practical example, but I think that it's, it's a means of making better use, better allocation of what the very limited health care resources that we have. And so when I talk to other investors, I mean, there's so many companies right now that are saying, we're an AI company. They actually call it AI washing. Like we are, mm. the term kind of came from a few years back where companies were greenwashing themselves. It was really in vogue to be green and eco-friendly, which it should be and still is now. Um, but now there's like an AI washing of Have you all every heard single... of AI washing? That's a new one. <laughs> a new but guys, we, we all have to understand most of this, I'm sorry, is hype. Yeah. Behavior modification, health choices, the most intense efforts at health health coaching and so forth. You know what average weight loss compared to placebo it causes in two years? It's the same number that I mentioned before <laughs> that, the, that the NIH has sequenced in the last five years. What's the average weight loss compared to placebo using the most intense health coaching possible? Zero compared to placebo. I'm sorry, but behavior modification is, we're human beings. We don't respond to that right now. Unless we figured out how to rewire our brains, we're gonna, all these things are, I'm sorry, they're, they're, well, just, they're, would, they're, they're just hype, they don't work. I would they, say that one of our portfolio companies, Verda, so they're treating folks with diabetes, they're doing a, a randomized um, controlled clinical trial on patients in the program. They've actually seen a reversal of people with diabetes for 60% of let, the let, folks let, that are yeah, in that yeah, program let, at let, the year mark. Let's, so. yeah, let's see the FDA approve it, because I've seen thousands of companies over the years, and this is why no, no, hardly any drugs get approved every year, because mm -hmm. people have early studies, they go to venture places, they try to raise money, they sell it on the hype, they make some, everybody makes money, everybody's happy, and in the long term, there's zero contribution to the healthcare problem. There's no really new important drugs or new important approaches. I think there's a different way about raising money that I'm a little bit proud of that I mentioned before. Other people have to step up. And when you say, how's this gonna get done? I'm very proud of this UK Biobank collaboration and the fact that seven different biopharma companies have stepped up. This is gonna be a $200 million investment right now and I hope to eventually actually double it. And you know what, you know how many drugs we're gonna get out? You know what people are, you know, there, there, there's no money to be made here. We're just creating a resource for the future. These are the sort of things that we have to understand unless we all commit and we do things not for the short term, not to get a gain tomorrow or next year or two years from now, not to rely on what the venture companies want because all they want is a rapid exit and make a few bucks. What we're talking about is real commitment, real investment by people who really know what they're doing to build resources that are going to change the way we invent new treatments in the future. That's what we need. Um, you mentioned the, the um, FDA um, and um, can we talk for a minute about the Trump administration's role in all this. Um, Scott Gottlieb's FDA last week said expanding a program to encourage use of AI in medicine and, and drug development. It's a new program, new incubator health technology. Um, what, aren't there regulatory issues here and other issues? I mean, and what do you think the commitment is from Washington uh, along these lines? Well, I know um, from people that I know know Scott that he's pretty serious about this. And I don't know that it comes from Trump. I think it actually comes from Scott Gottlieb himself. But in terms of regulatory issues, I mean, at the end of the day, like a lot of it is how do we decrease the, you know, increase successes and decrease all those failures, those 90% failures. And if you could mandate for every clinical trial that's done that the right kind of data gets measured, right, molecular along with phenotypic, along with clinical, and we can feed that in to learn what's the right subpopulations that truly are responding to the treatment and who isn't, um, that's information that can hopefully lead to faster approval cycles, but also by the time the drug gets on the market, we're targeting it to the right individual. Now, do you need these algorithms to go through FDA approval? It depends on how we use them. So we, we talk about things not working. I, I got to pause that. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. Okay. What I had just suggested is a brilliant way to actually create the data by actually demanding, by having, let's say, the FDA Absolutely. demand yeah. that all these, you guys should know this, some 90, 90% of clinical trials fail. And it's worse than that. We get no information out of it. We spend billions of dollars and no information out. What I is saying is why don't we mandate that we increase the cost of that by 10% yeah, probably. Not much, just phase two trials. To create yeah. 
that information, which then will add to the resources and it'll create hard data because there's nothing more rigorous than clinical trials. Yeah. That's a great idea about how to help create data using a different paradigm, maybe by encouraging it, giving tax rebates or so on that offset the increased cost. But that's something that would really benefit society. That's something that somebody should champion, you know, that idea. That is a great Let's idea. Let's do it. Let's go talk to so Scott. Jane, J &J, <laughs> clinical we, trial, J &J. J J clinical trial data is yeah. available yeah. via Princeton. Wait, is everybody sequenced? Do you have transcriptomes on everybody? Do you have biomarkers? The on clinical it? trial data from the J and J clinical trials is available to everybody to do research on via Clinton. Right, no, by but Princeton. I think what I was talking about is mandating that so we actually do this for all of our internal trials. Okay. Of course, we don't make it publicly available unless, you know, you know, because it's a huge amount of, uh, of investment. But I think mandating and somehow offsetting the cost to do the deep background work to create those resources. So, yeah, you link it to genetic and transcriptome variation, biomarkers and all that. That would be a true gift to, to mankind and society. That's a great idea that you I think know all what, of should get behind. You know what nobody's mentioned is the payer, and this is something, and I'm looking mm -hmm. at actually um, Megan and Lloyd here, because in a prior life, prior to J&J, I worked with both Rock Health and Stanford to create a platform for real world evidence, which is what payers and pharma and the digital companies are credibly interested in, because you go through this rigorous clinical trial process, and then beyond the clinical trial, those therapeutics or those interventions or those behavioral modifications are in the real world. And of course, people aren't perfect. They're not the way they are in clinical trials. So working with Stanford, it was a way to create how do you actually take all that data and how do you measure the way it's working? And of course, the payers are incredibly interested because they want drugs to work and they want them to work in the real world. So that's something that we haven't talked about, but this is an absolute application. And this is where the um, FDA is very, very involved because they want real world. I, I think that's another great opportunity that mm -hmm. as, a, as a society, we should figure out how to do. And the problem with payer-based information right now is that you don't really have very good information on how well a drug works. You just know whether somebody took it, whether somebody didn't take it, whether somebody paid for it, and so forth. So once again, creating harder data there mm -hmm. would be an enormous contribution as well. Uh, so if we could do a better job of getting better and allowing more public access to clinical trial data in a deeper way like I is saying, and also, somehow arming payer information so that it becomes a lot more valuable so you can actually get like response type availability to it, that could also really yeah, make I mean, a difference. It, so there's, it, the it, point it. is there's new ways. I, I was just suggesting one, but these guys have come up with two new ways of coming up with the data, which I think we're all talking about. That's the limiting thing. You can invest a lot of your own money, get 1,500 patients of myeloma. That's incredible. Okay, but we need, as a society, we need to up that a thousand fold. We gotta figure out how to do that, and I think these are two great ideas. Well, what and talk, let me ask you about the real world now, that yeah. you're talking about, and, and Lloyd and Megan, because you I thought come we were in, talking about the real world. Well, <laughs> let's, like, more specifically, when, when will like, real people and patients start feeling the, the, the benefits of, of some of this? Well, let's start, let, why don't you start, Megan? Okay, um, I mean, I would say, in, so it is not widespread, but I would say that a lot of them already are. And this is like a really simple example, but I think I like to say that once something becomes uh, common in use, we don't think of it as AI anymore. So if you take out your iPhone, you go to your photos and you type in dog, it's gonna come up with all the pictures that you have of a dog in your phone. Like would we, would we refer to that as AI? I don't think so, but it is, there is a, there is an image recognition algorithm that has been trained to identify the dog pictures in your phone, uh, but we would just call it a smarter phone, right? And so I think we're gonna see that um, with AI and healthcare where there are algorithms already supporting clinical decision support. So um, one company that we support, Agile MD, uh, they have a machine learning algorithm that helps to predict uh, patients that are at risk of, of uh, becoming septic, um, which is incredibly deadly condition. Uh, and so right now, um, nurses are monitoring that and are able to see when they expect that patient to decline so they can intervene earlier. And so I think that there are use cases that are currently being used, um, just not at, at the scale that we'll start to see. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I just want to, I want to go back to one point that George made. So, you know, George, I certainly agree. No one would argue that, um, that attempts at modifying behavior or modifying social environmental factors are vastly more complex and by and large have, have yielded disappointing results. But I would also say that the amount of both 
financial investment and also intellectual investment in approaches that seek to do that is a minuscule fraction of the amount of support that's gone into drug development or a full-fledged clinical trial of a new drug. And, you know, there, there are some amazing successes. I mean, we're now, you know, when I started out in medicine, HIV was a 100% fatal disease. It's now a managed, controlled chronic disease. You know, that's amazing. But a that wasn't lot, behavior modification. No, it wasn't. But a lot of drugs that have come onto the market that don't have that same sort of transformative pathophysiologic impact are when we really do start looking at real world evidence and payers increasingly want to, um, you know, don't live up to what the initial clinical trial showed. Now, that's no one's fault, but it just, I think it underscores the importance of just because it's been difficult and because the limited studies that have been done with the limited funding available for those studies that seek to address behavioral factors, for example, just because they have failed to currently yield the type of long-term results we'd like to see, I don't think for a moment needs to, means that we need to back away from I, I them. I keep hoping, I keep hoping that my personal behavioral modification approach is going to start working any time now. But we would be remiss if we don't mention that but you there know the a, other thing AI, is the was, other thing is I, we have to look at also at how we train physicians, how we organize the healthcare delivery system. You know, right now we have the most extraordinarily reactive healthcare delivery system you could imagine. You know, we're focused on treating disease once it occurs. We really haven't devoted the type of intellectual resources or focus on prediction and prevention. I mean, diagnostics well, are still at a fraction of where they should be based upon the science we have available right, today. We, have, well, well, we need to go to questions <laughs> now, so I want to hear from the audience. We'll do that really quickly. We have one right in the front row. And please identify yourself. Sorry, uh, Dan Furstenberg, Jeffries. Uh, I'm hoping I could throw out to you all, just getting back to AI yeah. um, and, and data, <laughs> if, if I may. Mm -hmm. Um, you look at tech, even energy, they seem to be so much further in the curve of adoption of AI as a uh, discipline rather than an ancillary kind of use um, than healthcare broadly. Yeah. So I throw it out to you all, as it relates specifically to AI and data usage, uh, you just look at data scientists, it seems like there's a dearth of data scientists specifically in the healthcare space, particularly in large cap pharma. Can you all talk about what the divide is there, who's doing it well, are there some large cap companies that actually have a real data science effort? Um, and also, kind of going back to some allusions you made earlier, what are you all doing in the private and the public sector um, together on the origination side vis-a-vis -vis privacy issues and patients to get that sample set as vast as you can so you can actually execute, right? There's two parts, there's the origination of the data and then the execution. So well, the two part we, question. Why don't we take yeah. that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, so I'll take that first part on the sort of market adoption. So there isn't a major pharmaceutical company out there that does not have machine learning in ad in its mind. You can look at the recent quotes by the new CEO of Novartis. I saw it, but yeah. It was, yeah, but they don't really, no, I don't speak about that. No, no, but, but so they what? All have it. They all have it. And so what you're talking about is institutions that um, are set up to make drugs. And who makes drugs? Chemists and biologists and clinicians. And these folks haven't been trained in undergrad and graduate school to do mathematics, to do computer science. And so, uh, but now we're starting to see those generation of people, and they tend to be really young. I'm organizing a conference in two days, machine learning and AI, and somebody asked me to find an advanced engineer who's been doing it for 20 years. You're looking at them. <laughs> the physicists have been doing it for 20 years, not that many. <laughs> so it's all new to the field, and we're, you know, biologists are starting to get trained in it, and um, folks who are doing um, data science and other fields are starting to go into it. So I think we're going to see these things merge. And there's a handful of pharma companies that have been doing computational biology for quite some time. Um, and they're coming up to actually do more of this in-house, um, either you know, buy it, partner, or, or hire it. So we're going to see more and more of that. But a lot of also what's you know, slowing down adoption is, is we're talking about just transforming how a whole science is done, how actually going from a, an empirical way of doing discovery and learning to something that is quantitative. I mean, it's, you know, physicists have been doing this now for a very long time. We've recently applied AI machine learning and algorithms to data coming from Large Hadron Colliders and predicted the God particle. The, I mean, that's the kind of transformation of how we want to do science. It's that, that whole cycle between 
collecting data, learning from data, and an but augmented I, doesn't way, it come and back to the itself. same thing? Physicists have hard data. You know, they do one experiment, <laughs> and they 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 got a you know million pieces of hard data. data. That's true. Okay, they, biologists need. It. But we would re be remiss if we don't point out that just last week was the first approval of an IA-based diagnostic device right. that uh, does not require a health practitioner to make a diagnostic decision. And this was sort of going back to Rowan's point, it was based on image analysis mm -hmm. of retinas to diagnose diabetic retinopathy and make not the diagnostic decision, mm -hmm. but the decision about whether the diabetic patient has significant enough eye disease that they should go see a specialist to be evaluated. It is a, it's a, it's a great, I think, advance. It's an example of what Lloyd was sort of saying about changing the way we do healthcare. But this also comes back to, you know, when you talk about who are the bad guys here or why we don't use behavior modification or preventative approaches or so forth. One of the problems is, one question is going to be, is this predicts that this could lead to millions more patients now requiring eye treatment. Some would argue the preferred eye treatment might be <laughs> ILEA, our drug. Okay, so some people would, would, would actually think this could be a benefit. The patients yes. now would have preventative, disease, preventative measures and so forth. But in America, the average amount of time that a, a payer, I don't know why we call them payers, insurance companies, big bad insurance companies cover you is one to two years. Do you think that they have an interest in paying for not only the preventative diagnostic AI-based imaging here, but also the treatment that would prevent your eye disease four or five years from now? Does that make business sense? These are one of the problems. When you talk about why there's not enough enough focus on prevention is because of the way our healthcare system is actually structured and the fact that insurance companies don't care how you're doing in five years or even in two years, okay, because you're somebody else's problem. So, Great AI advance, I'll be very interested to see how it's adopted and if it's adopted widely, because what it's going to lead to is a, a major preventative medicine challenge. Other, other questions? I want, yeah, to, can, I want to answer Dan's okay. question a little bit more. Okay, just again, right, I, I just, I just on a very um, pragmatic approach again. So when you think about the people who've learned, who've been trained on data, they tend to be the physicists and the mathematicians. And if you think about, and this comes back to the data, the place they originally were, you used to be able to find them, were the astrophysicists or the geologists or the weather scientists. So those were the people who were used to that kind of data. Now, if you think about healthcare and life sciences, some of the data generation tools, the cost of them has only recently come down to actually generate the data that enable these data scientists to then have, an, to make their skill set worthwhile for this set of data. So. Everything that's said is true, but you just have to think about it into a time-based fashion. So if you think about Illumina sequencing 10 years ago, it was too expensive. It's getting to the point where it's cheap enough to be able to generate the kind of data sets. And if you then start looking in the universities, what I'm observing is the guys that have been in these large tech companies like the Googles and the Facebooks, they're now looking for mission and they want to do something with healthcare. So they're going back into the universities to go and get PhDs in biology. So then they, then they can come and be in the companies like J&J &J and startup companies that are making a difference to the human health conditions. So it's not a, I wouldn't say it's a negative on the healthcare. I think it's just an evolutionary, it's a time of evolution. We have time for one more question if anyone in the audience has one. And instead, then, if there's no questions, I'll go straight to a quick, very quick lightning round where I'm going to ask everyone to just go around and say what, what's, I mean, it's, it's interesting listening because I hear a lot of, I do hear what sounds very daunting, but I also hear some excitement. I hear both. Um, George, like, you're, you're, you, you get me all excited, but then you also <laughs> seem to think it, it sounds impossible. Too, so I'm hearing both sides of it, but but in general, I feel like you all are more positive than negative. And I saw a Stephen Hawking quote um, today uh, from the late Stephen Hawking, where he said, "AI could spell the end of the human race." I don't think you all <laughs> feel feel that way, but but I'd like you to just quickly go around and say, what are you most excited about? That um, do you think can happen in this realm, and what what are you most what do you think is most overhyped that's never, never going to come to okay. pass? So healthcare, cost quality access. 
So I'm most excited about access, because I think that AI will enable access to healthcare for more people. Just believe that. Um, what I'm most worried about is quality. I'm worried about the wrong predictions being made, and then people throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I'm excited to be able to learn from a lot of these data sets with varying degrees of quality of what treatments are working for whom so we can do a better job of matching treatments to patient and where we can't match them then learning from that what new treatments can be and this is all within reach and we are showing examples and work and publications that actually show that. My biggest worry is just that we're not learning fast enough because at the end of the day I don't want to get sick, I don't want any of my relatives to get sick and I would prefer to live forever. <laughs> <laughs> There's a prominent venture capitalist whose name I won't mention who on panels like this likes to turn to me and say, you know, I'm going to put you and your medical school out of business in the next decade because all we're going to need is data scientists, physicians, and other healthcare professionals are going to be out the door. Well, I'm not worried about that. I am excited about... I wish that was true. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited about what AI <laughs> offers in terms of enabling high tech, enabling high touch because... It, what was alluded to today is that, that you know, we have a crisis in healthcare today where over 50% of the physician workforce in America is burned out. There are a variety of reasons for that. I think that high-tech approaches can enable physicians to get back to the type of, of empathetic, uh, high-touch uh, medicine that drove most of us to go into medicine to begin with. Uh, and improve the way we're delivering care and the way patients are able to engage with us in the healthcare delivery system. That was really similar to mine, but <laughs> I'm also very excited about uh, AI actually restoring some of the humanity back into the healthcare system. So looking at it, not just from the provider perspective, but from the patient perspective, being able to go to your physician and not having them just steeped in their computer, but you know, having voice recognition software so that it can you know, take your conversation that you're having face to face and actually get that into the electronic health record in hopefully usable fashion uh, with, with clean data that we can use. So I'm excited about that. And then one thing I'd say I'm a, a bit worried about is we didn't get into a lot of the ethics around mm -hmm. uh, patient data and privacy and your right to know how your data is being used and, and what algorithms are being right. used uh, for your diagnosis and care that you're getting. There's a lot of passive data collection that's happening right now and you could see you know, a mental health app that's collect, scraping all sorts of data about you and, and when we're making predictions about that sort of thing, what's not to stop someone from making predictions about violent behavior and then you get into a minority report sort of situation if you go to the far extreme. And so I think that we do need to be more conscious as a society about um, what data is in the ether is being collected and is being used even if we're talking about for positive purposes on this panel, um, it may not mm -hmm. always be used for those purposes. I agree with everything that everybody's saying. Uh, I just want to keep reminding, hammering, if you, didn't, if you didn't hear it, okay, what we need. We're going to have incremental advances like the diabetic retinopathy, AI scan, and so forth and so on. But to make true, real investments at a really large scale, we need to generate big data. I like these ideas about how we can maybe change the ways we all go about getting that big data. But I also agree with Lloyd's dream. My dream is also that eventually this sort of big data that we're all trying to create is going to lead to, let's say, the Bloomberg terminal for the healthcare professional. So they won't have to try to figure it all out and spend all their time. They'll be able to get the computer, spit out a few mm -hmm. simple algorithms and opportunities, and they'll be able to spend more time delivering actual health care as opposed to trying to m mine this data personally because it will be impossible, especially when you throw the genome on top of everything else they have to deal with and so forth. So there's, I think, an, an enormous opportunity here, but as a society, we have to recognize that it's going to take a big investment over quite a bit amount of time for us to get to the point where it really is going to make a huge investment in how we deliver and, 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 and provide health care in this nation.